He is back a second time on the podcast. Please welcome Mark Morris back. And this week we are going to talk about the Norman Conquest. Last time he spoke about the Anglo-Saxon world. So in a sense, it's kind of a sequel to the, uh, that previous episode. And of course, he's the author of um, the book, The Norman Conquest, and of course, The Anglo-Saxons of Both, which I held up here, and several other books. And but I want to begin straight away because we, last time we spoke about so about how you came to study these kind of topics in the medieval England. So let's talk about but the state we've we left off at the end of the Anglo-Saxon world, and that's where we're going to begin now. So let's talk about the begin- end of the beginning of what led up to the Norman Conquest under England under Edward the Confessor. Yeah, well, um, where to begin? Ed, you mentioned Edward the Confessor. Edward the Confessor, for those that don't recall, his dates reigned from 1042 to 1066 itself. Um, and the kingdom that he ruled, England, as you know, we talked about in the previous podcast, England was a precociously centralised and well-organised state. Um, I don't think state is too anachronistic a word for England in this period. So um, the king's authority stretches all the way. Well, it covers most of what is now modern England. So all the way from the English Channel up to the borders with Scotland. Um, it has a silver coinage. It has a, a taxation system, which was um, developed in the early 11th century during the reign of Edward's father. Um, and so it is unified. It is rich, prosperous and for the most part, peaceful. Um, Edward's reign um it came after a, a fairly um, tumultuous period in the 1030s where there was a, a, a succession of um, or a series rather of succession disputes. Um, and although he has um, uh, disputes um, almost to the point of civil war with his in-laws, the Godwinsons, um, his reign is for the most part peaceful. And um, and as I say, because England is very prosperous, um, other people start looking at England um, with kind of um, acquisitive eyes in the course of the middle of the 11th century, because the main problem that Edward the Confessor has, whatever his faults or merits as a king, and those are still debated, he has one overriding problem, and that is he doesn't have any children. No, no sons, particularly. I mean, no sons or daughters. But the fact he has no sons means, and and no surviving brothers. Um, he has very distant relatives who crop up later in the story who have to be found living in distant Hungary. But it means that other people start weighing their own claims to the English throne in the ten fifties and ten sixties, and it's clear that when Edward dies, um, there is going to be another succession dispute and what we end up with of course is the the biggest succession dispute or the most famous one in all of english history mm. and of course one of them is who claims the throne and let's talk about how it's right because he's a bastard and the, let's talk about william william the conquerors or william bastard as he's known back mm. before that he conquers england so let's talk about how it's right to the throne what he makes him considering he is like a, like i said a bastard and how, what gave him the right to rule England? Well, um, people at the time and people down to the present think that you know William's own claim to the throne was 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 vanishingly well, vanishingly small was was impossibly thin and weak. I mean, to talk to give you a bit more of the backstory there, um, and and to switch back to Edward for a second, mm. Edward the Confessor, when he was in his early teens or mid teens had been forced to flee into exile because England was conquered by the Danes, um, the Danish king Knut um, is also king of England. And Ed, Edward and his uh, surviving siblings uh, end up in Normandy um, because his mother, Emma, was a Norman. Um, and so he spends the next quarter of a century living in exile in Normandy, really, I think, without much hope of reclaiming his birthright, if you like. And then all of a sudden finds himself in the position of becoming king in 1042, all of which is to say um, his upbringing is 
from his early teens onwards and into middle age is Norman, i.e. it's French. So he's steeped in a world of people speaking French, people building castles, people riding horses into battle. You know, he's doing things and he used to doing politics and war um, in a French way. And when he um, comes to the throne in 1042, although he's English by birth, he's really Norman by upbringing. And in, again, this is debated and we haven't got time to drill down into all the detail of the sources, but the Normans later maintained that when he fell out, when Edward fell out with the Godwinsons in 1051, he promised the throne, he promised the English succession to his cousin, who was Duke William of Normandy, who was about... Um, trying to get this right, it was about 20 years younger than Edward himself, but they had known each other while he was in Normandy. And I think there's no doubt that Edward, having spent 25 years in Normandy, did feel a, a debt to his um, Norman relatives. Um, so that's the basis. The basis of William's claim is that, well, Edward promised it to me. And we know that Ed, we know that William did cross to England in 1051 or 1052. Um, but there are, as I said, there are other claimants in the, because I, I think that that notion of having a Norman Duke becoming King of England went down very badly in in England itself. So in England, there is certainly a, a large party of people or a sizable uh, cohort of people um, desperately trying to find a, a preferable successor and trying to get these remnants of the royal family, the old royal family of England, back from Hungary. Um, that doesn't go terribly well in that the, the, the claimant they're hoping for dies as soon as he sets foot in England, but he does leave a, a, a young son who's five years old. So there is a there is a, a, a um, an old English claimant hanging around Edward's court, but he's a young boy without really any substantial backers. The third and most important or the third and, and more important um, claimant to the throne is Harold Godwinson, who is the eldest son eldest surviving son of the late Earl Godwin, who had been the big noise in England in the first um, half of the 11th century. And um, Harold and his brothers throughout the course of the 1040s and into the 1050s are acquiring the sort of the levers of power at a rate of knots. So Harold becomes ultimately becomes Earl of Wessex. His brother Tostig becomes Earl of Northumbria. His other brothers have East Anglia and other regional earldoms. So England is on the on the almost on the cusp of being a one party state under the Godwins in the final years of Edward the Confessor's reign. And so the the Godwins really had been aiming at that prize. You can see that that's been the plan for at least a generation before 1066. Because the other thing to remember is that uh, Harold's brother, uh, sorry, Harold's sister, Edith, um, she is married to Edward the Confessor. So Harold and his brothers, they are all brothers, brother-in-laws to the aging, childless Edward the Confessor. Mm. So they see themselves as the sort of the natural party of government who are going to step in once Edward dies. The problem they have, much like William the Conqueror, is that they have no blood claim to the throne. They can only say, well, he promised it to me, mm. which is exactly what they say happened as Edward is breathing his last breaths. You know, on his deathbed, the, the, the story is told afterwards, oh, he bequeathed in his final moments, he said that Harold should take care of the kingdom once he was gone. Mm. So there's nobody, um, well, I say nobody, there is a five-year-old boy um, mm who well, I say he's five years old, he's five years old in 1057. He's in his early teens uh, in 1066. There is a, a, a young, um, friendless, half Hungarian teenager who has a, a good blood claim to the throne or the best blood claim to the throne. And there are two very powerful men in the form of Harold Godwinson and William Duke of Normandy who have very weak claims to the throne, but they are extremely powerful warlords. And I think it's just to show us many centuries later what led up to the Wars of the Roses with Henry VI being a child king, as we all know how well that went. So, yeah, yeah, um, you can draw parallels with other periods, certainly. So let's talk about Harold Godwinson. Of course, as you know, he would well take over 
as king of England, and this this does not please William, Duke William, very much, does it? No, I mean because um, the, you know this, this is a this is um, a period where, I, unlike earlier bits of the 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 Anglo-Saxon story, you know, where we were grasping around for details, this is a period which is richly documented. There's very strong uh, narrative sources, so we know quite a lot of the 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 ins and outs of the politics. Um, at some stage, shortly before 1066, either 1065 or more more likely 1064, Harold pays a visit to William in Normandy for reasons which are debated. Um, but um, for diplomatic reasons, probably, he visits William in Normandy and William uses that opportunity to extract a promise from Harold that when the time comes, when Edward the Confessor dies, that Harold will work for William's succession. Um, what happens, of course, is when, as soon as Edward dies on the, uh, the uh, when is it, the 5th of January, 1066, um, Harold immediately has himself crowned um, very next day as Edward's successor. So William sees that as a betrayal. Mm. And what it means is the only way that William can prosecute his claim to the throne is through violence, through war. Um, Harold has seized that opportunity and had himself crowned. And that's very difficult to undo. I mean, it's impossible to undo it until the king dies. Um, so it's going to be a, um, uh, a physical dust up to see, you know, to sort out this succession crisis from that point on. Were Harold supported by local elites in the country, or was he? Because as we know, the Normans were not the popular after their country. Yeah, but I was think he... Harold was. I think Harold was almost certainly the popular candidate. I mean, it's the thing that makes it difficult to dis disentangle or to interpret is the majority of the sources we have for England prior to the conquest are, or certainly the most vocal ones, are Godwinson propaganda. So there is a, a, a source which is now called The Life of King Edward, who rests at Westminster, that sounds like it's a biography of Edward the Confessor, when it is, in fact, a history of the Godwin family. It begins with Godwin. Um, and it, it, it's a song in praise of his, his children, um, Edith, uh, Edward the Confessor's queen, and very specifically Harold and his other brunga Tostig. Harold is, emerges as the superhero in that story. And um, so that gives the impression that they were extremely popular. They were, we could certainly see they were powerful to the extent of how many, how many men they had at their command, you know, how many, how much power they'd accrued in the two decades prior to 1066. So there's no doubt they're very powerful. Um, and probably, you know, the, 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 the popular English candidates. Um, so, in that sense, Harold has got a lot going for him, but he does have um, William to worry about. Would it have been, and obviously didn't rule for very long, but would it have been a decent king from of no of him if he has I, if he had been the victor? Yeah, I think I think that's a reasonable assumption because his his record up to that point was was um, was pretty good. I mean, he'd. He had um, intervened in Wales um, in it's 1062 or 1063. He has a couple of campaigns into Wales and, and we're told he subdues all of Wales. Um, and he'd been on successful or he'd been on diplomatic missions to the continent. He visited Rome. What Harold really has going for him is he's experienced um, in that he's probably about in his early 40s, like William, very similar age to William, maybe a couple of years older, and unlike the, the 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 candidate who has been pushed by other um, you know sort of ca uh, vested interests at court, um, he's not a thirteen year old boy who's completely untried and inexperienced. So Harold has has that going for him. Of course, I mean I'm trying to keep this as a reveal because I think it was a reveal to the people at the time. But there is a, another person who throws his hat into the ring very late in the day who is Harold Hardrada, King of Norway. Um, so this happens in the early autumn or late summer of 1066, when the, for, the, for the rest of the year, since the springtime, both William and Harold have been building up their armies and their navies in anticipation of this clash between England and Normandy for the throne of England. And then all of a sudden, uh, in, in the late summer, there is a Norwegian fleet arrives uh, in, in northern England or 
Scotland first and then sails to Northern England, um, which seems to take everybody completely unawares. The word that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle uses to describe their appearance is unwearing, you know. And um, as I say, the, the King of Norway is called Harold Hardrada, it's, which is confusing because he's fighting another King Harold. But um, as is pretty well known, although Harold Hardrada has a fearsome reputation as kind of like a, you know, a, a Viking adventurer across all of Europe and his, his, his stories were later became a, the stuff of legend in Scandinavia, the, 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 uh, yeah. the sagas. Harold Godwinson, the crowned English king, rushes up to Yorkshire the minute he hears, the minute he learns that, that um, his namesake has arrived and defeats him in battle, defeats and kills Harold. Hardrada in battle, along with uh, Harold Godwinson's treacherous younger brother, Tostig. So um, that itself, that I think is the single uh, strongest uh, thing in, in Harold Godwinson's CV that suggests that this he was indeed a very formidable warrior and a very formidable um, tactician, you know, general. Um, the fact that he was able to outfox and then defeat the, the legendary Harold Hardrada. So that that is, I think, the point where you could see he must have imagined at that point, and his subjects must have imagined a long and glorious rule ahead, having pulled off that extraordinary victory. And in fact, he had about two and a half weeks left to live. Ooh. So, of course, another, as mentioned, another one that prepares for battle is, of course, within the Conqueror as well. So let's begin with his invasion of Sussex in southern England. Mm. Well, yeah, I mean, William has been preparing since the spring of 1066. Um, unlike his the Vikings who, who sort of intervene, um, he's, he has to spend a long time building up the, the, the ships that he needs, the naval force he needs. The Normans themselves, of course, had once been Vikings. They'd settled in um, nor northwestern Francia, um, from the late ninth century, but 150 years on, they'd sort of forsaken their their longboats, and they were much more practiced with cavalry warfare than they were with um, you know raising armadas. So you see them on the Bayer Tapestry building boats from scratch, and we know they were borrowing boats and buying boats and rapidly trying to cobble together sufficient ships to transport an army um of several thousand men and horses across the channel in order to um contest the crown of england um it seems that that invasion force was ready by the middle of the summer um according to well-informed chronicles they are unable to set sail because of contrary winds um they finally set sail um in uh, the late september um, 1066 and sail into a storm and get blown into the neighbouring province of Pontieu and it's not until um, sorry I said late September it's not until mid-September they get built they get blown to Pontieu it's in late September 27th or 28th that they finally embark across the channel and land on the um, the coast of Sussex at Pevensey on either the 28th or 29th of September of course there is no one there to confront them, because at this point, Harold Godwinson is in the north of England fighting Harold Hardrada. Um, and the really sort of fascinating thing is William himself setting sail on the 27th or 28th of September was aware of the fact that the Norwegians had invaded England because that had happened two or three weeks earlier. That news would have reached him. But he's completely unaware of the outcome of the Battle of Stamford Bridge, where the two Harolds fought. So he sails into the unknown uh, in late September 1066, not knowing whether he is going to be fighting the Norwegian Harold or the English Harold. Mm. And so it's, it's, it's one of those kind of great what if moments. Mm. Is there any chance that Harold, the Norwegian Harold, could have won the Battle of Stamford Bridge at all? Do we know the numbers that they are presented with at oh, the battle? I think in all of these cases, there's every chance. I mean, everything. I mean, I'm not particularly a military historian, but I've read enough about battles over the sort of thousand years that I study to know that you know it's often the underdog wins it's not it's it's not always the the the, the commander with the most men or the most horses or you know it, surprise um the, the weather conditions 
Um, and um, luck, I mean, that's the other thing that plays a huge role in all of this. These are commanders, unlike, you know, modern commanders, uh, you think of maybe First World War generals who were like five miles behind the front. You know, these are men leading from the front and therefore putting themselves uh, in peril, you know, in, 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 in act, you know, very strong chance of being killed. Um, so it, it's Harold Hardrada uh, is supposed to have got an arrow in the neck at Stamford Bridge. And that means his invasion is over. Similarly, Harold Godwinson, whether or not he gets an arrow in the eye, as the Bayer Tapestry would lead us to believe or might suggest. Um, Harold definitely dies at, at uh, Hastings in 1066, uh, meaning William is the winner. But that that so easily could have been the other way. There is a point during the Battle of Hastings when all the sources agree that the, a rumour ran through the Norman ranks that William had been killed and everybody starts to panic and run away. And it's only with great difficulty that the situation is retrieved and the Normans are regrouped. So yeah, any of these battles, it, it is, it's, it, I mean, I mean, there you can think of lots of other examples across the centuries uh, where history kind of hint is on a hinge. What well, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, when Caesar crosses the channel to Britain, how weather played a huge part of why he failed. And he was unlucky in the sense of weather that he was never able to conquer Britain because of yes. Britain. And I think I mean that's another thing. I mean, you I could I could bring that under my 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 you know umbrella term of luck, but yes. Any single factor could have upset the outcome mm. of these clashes. Um, so, of course, I mean, what people would have said at the time and what was written at the time was that this was God's verdict. You know, when these these men are bringing their armies against each other, of course, they do all they can to try and engineer the outcome they want and to survive. But the, they would be the first to admit, and uh, you know, that, that God decides the what happens, the outcome of a battle, not not mere men, you know. So um, yes, it could. It, all of these things could have gone the other way, but the one thing that we're all reasonably certain on still is that Harold lost and William won on the fourteenth of October, ten sixty six, with huge sweeping consequences. And we don't want to talk about the Battle of Hastings in a second, of course. But one thing that the Normans did bring with them as well. It's the Moth and infamous Moth and Bailey castles they are very well known for. Yes, they, I mean, they brought castles full stop. I mean, England um, had experienced castles during the reign of Edward the Confessor, but only three or four. And significantly, those three or four were built by Edward the Confessor's French friends who he brought with him from Normandy. So, um, although we hear mention of a castle in 1051 in England, um, after the Norman Conquest, there's a deluge of castles. And they're not big, sophisticated things, or at least in, in the vast majority of cases, they are not big stone, hulking stone fortresses that, as you might expect, they are, in every case, they start off being made of earth and timber. And you mentioned Mott and Baileys. They're not all Mott and Baileys, but there's a kind of, that is the kind of common or garden design in about three out of four cases. You have a... Uh, a, a huge mound of earth, which is the mot, maybe, maybe in in the most in the largest cases, maybe a hundred feet high, um, about thirty meters high, mm -hmm. and on top of that, a wooden tower. So that is your your sort of um, the 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 heart of your defense defenses, and at the at the base of that, a much larger, shallower enclosure which is the bailey, which is where all the other buildings go, all the, you know, the, 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 the hall, the chapel, the stables, the smithy, et cetera. Um, the English had fortifications, but they were older and they were larger and they were communal. They called them burrs. They didn't have anything to compare with these newfangled fortifications that were springing up all over the continent in the previous 50 years to 1066. And that the fact that this is a, a, a shock to the English comes across very strongly in the sources, whether you're reading uh, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which talks about, you know, they built castles and had poor men oppressed, you know, uh, or um, uh, the Norman Chronicles, uh, Orderic Vitalis, who's half English, half Norman, talks about how the English didn't have castles. And so even though they were very strong and loved fighting, they could only put up a weak show of resistance to the Normans. So castles were seen at the time 
as being absolutely key to securing England after the Battle of Hastings. At what point does it begin to build the infamous castle, Dover Castle, at the, in this timeline? Well, Dover Castle is, is, is one of those kind of exceptions in that Dover had been a, a fortification of some kind for about a thousand years or more before the conquest, two and a half, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, about 1500 years before the conquest, because it started... And you had the infamous Roman lighthouse as well. Exactly. Evidence. But that's, I mean, even that was, that was an addition, it, it originally, uh, as far as we can tell, um, Dover Castle was an Iron Age hill fort. So there are always castles which are built on top of earlier fortifications. So you can find I mean, the Tower of London is built against the city wall, the old Roman walls of London. Porchester Castle is built in an old Roman shore fort. Pevensey Castle, where the Normans land, they modify, but that's an old Roman shore fort. So Dover Castle, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's there already as some kind of fortification. What the Normans seem to do, as they do at all of these big old fashioned um large communal fortifications is they hive off a small portion of them maybe 15 percent of the of the, the the area and call that area the castle and that's quite clear at a number of early sites like pevensey porchester winchester rochester dover london that, that that's what's going on mm. So, of course, I know you want to talk about this this battle, and you mentioned it a few times already. So let's talk about what I'm sure everybody has been waiting for, the famous Battle of Hastings. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, okay. <laughs> talk about um, well, I mean, it's, it's as I say, it's well documented. Um, it's There are at least two very strong narrative sources. There's a, a, something called the Song of the Battle of Hastings, which seems to have been written within a year or so of the, the battle itself. Um, there is a very long description of the battle in the contemporary biography of William the Conqueror by his chaplain, William of Poitiers. And of course, there's the Bayer tapestry, which means mm. we have more or less contemporary images of the battle, um, which, which can tell us a lot of incidental detail simply because, you know, we've got pictures, things that wouldn't be described in the narrative sources, like, you know, what kind of how they wore their hair or, you know, just sort of mundane details like that. So we're, we're very well informed about the battle. And, and unlike a lot of earlier battles, we can chart uh, its course with some, you know, some confidence. And in, in sort of short summary, what seems to happen is um, Harold marches down from Yorkshire, hoping to catch William unawares. William becomes aware of his advance uh, in the 24 hours prior to the battle and marches out to meet him because William is camped at Hastings, uh, hence the name of the battle, and advances inland to, to meet Harold. And they meet at a place which at the time didn't have a name, um, seven miles northwest of Hastings, but after the battle and ever since has been known simply as battle. Ooh. And... As far as we can tell, the two sides were evenly matched, although they made war in different ways because the Norman elite rode into battle on horseback. The, the English elite chose to stand and fight with the rest of the infantry. Um, they are fairly evenly matched because the battle goes on all day. The English had the advantage of being on the top of a hill. The Normans were charging up it. It's not particularly steep as hills go, but that's still an advantage. And it, as, as we've already said, Anything might have happened. It might have gone entirely differently were it not for the fact that as night, uh, sorry, as day was turning to night, um, Harold was mortally wounded, whether it was from an arrow in the face or as the song of the Battle of Hastings says from a dedicated Norman death squad doing him in. Where we can't be 100 percent certain, but um, that. The fact that he died meant that the succession dispute was over. And as I've already said, people would have said at the time, God had decided that William should be the new King of England. So, of course, what happened next is, of course, that he is crowned the King of England. And I want to know, in order to talk about the crowning as well, do the people of England and, and the end they lead, I've referred to here, of course, do they look at him as an usurper to the throne? But they must have been, right? He kind of lost an usurper at this point. I'm not quite sure. Did you think of him as a usurper? Yeah. 
Um, I th I think from that point on, I mean, once he's once Harold is dead, there is a there is a small contingent of people who yeah. try and rally round the uh, teenage Edgar Etheling, the, mm -hmm. the young boy I mentioned earlier. But the Norman War Machine is kind of rolling on and, and devastating southeastern England. It's kind of you know harrying its way around the country, trying to terrify the the people who are holding out into submission so it's a, a few weeks before christmas so a, a month or so a couple of months after hastings that the english ride out from london the 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 remaining kind of you know refuseniks and uh submit to william so prior to the conversation uh, coronation um the english have already kind of submitted on mass and i think from that point on um you know the you can see you can see people trying to make it work from that point on in a sense of you know trying to limit the endless bloodshed that has been going on in some sense since um the beginning of the autumn uh trying to sort of stitch the kind of political landscape back together and say well clearly this guy has been you know divinely favored and we should support him um and that 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 those kind of that that is um ceremonially um displayed in in the coronation ceremony what happens in the months that follow is there are uh increasing numbers of english people who feel that they have got a rum deal that they have been dispossessed of their estates by the arrival of the normans they have no stake in this new regime and they rebel against it so you get rebellions against the conquest uh, almost immediately. I mean, William goes back to Normandy in the uh, the spring of 1067, and there are there are the rebellions in Kent. There's rebellions in the Welsh marches, and there are more and more rebellions, um, culminating in the the great rebellion, great Northern Rebellion of 1069-70, throughout the first four or five years of William's reign. So, yes, I think people are. Uh, the, a, a large majority of people are accepting at first, but for you know for a variety of reasons. Mo I think the the most important one is that, as I say, you end up with people who are left with a reduced stake or no stake at all in society, who are driven to try and overturn the verdict of ten sixty six. So let's talk about some of the changes. You mentioned some of them, but some changes are before and after. Norman conquest, how it changes for people in general. Yeah, well, I mean, there. I th I think it's it's arguably the, the the greatest change that England ever experiences in one you know sudden hit, um, and the, you know the, to reduce that to its fundamentals, as I say, as I said a minute ago, um, the the old English ruling class increasingly find themselves dispossessed, they rebel. The, the penalty for rebellion is dispossession. So the more people rebel and the uh, the longer that goes on, the more Englishmen end up being cut out. Meaning by the time you get to the end of William's reign, and of course we can assess the 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 the, the huge amount of change in land holding because he, he commissions Doomsday Book at the end of his reign, mm. we can see that there's virtually no English people in power at all. Maybe you know, sort of 1% of the highest echelon and maybe about 5 to 10% of the lower echelons of the aristocracy are still English. Everyone else is from Normandy or northern France. So the fact that you've replaced almost wholesale the ruling class of England with a bunch of people who aren't from England, they don't speak English, you know, and they, they have very different ideas, not only about language, but about the way you should govern society, that has huge knock-on changes in the generations that follow. And just quickly off the top of my head, I mean, we've already talked about some practical things like the Normans, the Norman elite ride to war rather than uh, marching into battle. The Normans build castles. Uh, the, the English hadn't done that. Um, the Normans, um, as well as, you know, introducing castles, they're ripping down all the old English churches, which they thought were antiquated and in need of renewal. So they're introducing Romanesque architecture. Um, and that's, you know, that happens really, really quickly in the space of 50 years or so. Every single English cathedral and every great in old English abbey is ripped down to its foundations and rebuilt in this very strange new uh, foreign style. Um, 
they also have different ideas about the way society should be regulated. So they, um, the Normans are, are, are down on slavery, um, slavery which had kind of been prevalent across all of um, Western Europe in the um, first millennium AD is falling out of favour in northern France and Normandy from around the turn of the first millennium, but not in England or not in Britain for that matter. So in England, people are still individually bought and sold like chattels, like, you know, like the beasts in the field. Um, that's not something that the Normans buy into. So you see slavery decline in the generation or two after the conquest. I mean, it has to be said that a lot of people who were formerly free in England are made to work harder and are made to do um, boon work. So harder. basically serfdom is introduced as well. So what's that? Serfdom? Surf, well, sir, this is whether whether feudalism or serfdom is introduced. There's something like that. It's very much like that going on before the conquest. I think, I mean, it, the difficulty of using words like serfdom or feudalism is that feudalism in particular is kind of like, it's not a word that's not used until the Tudor period. And it, it doesn't, it has a variety of modern um, meanings or as it's understood in a, in a huge variety of ways. What's undoubtedly the case is that England and people in England are made to work harder and for less in the way of personal gain than they have been prior to the conquest. Um, and that, as, as you would expect, you know, as, as with other, you know, societies that are conquered by foreigners and, and colonised, for want of a better word, you know, the, 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 their new overlords are interested in maximizing profits and you can see that again in doomsday book you know rents have skyrocketed and you have as well as the the huge amount of actual um raw um uh, data in the numbers doomsday box doomsday book sometimes preserves anecdotal things like you know he now holds his lands in heaviness and misery um but as i say there is there is a a, a flip side to that which is the people who had been most oppressed at the bottom of anglo-saxon society the slaves find that their lot has improved after the conquest so i mean i mean you know regardless of whether i mean i i dare say that the you know the 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 net outcome of that is more misery and more oppression for the majority of people um but the, the thing is, this is just such huge amounts of social change. This is why it continues to fascinate. Mm -hmm. And there's one other aspect in which the Normans differ to their Anglo-Saxon predecessors in that they are chivalrous in the way that the Anglo-Saxons had not been. And by that, I specifically mean they spared people once they had surrendered. Um, and that's not something that you see in... English politics prior to 1066, you see people, once they're defeated, being beheaded or having their throats slit when they come around for dinner, you know, that it's a very um, old school, Scandinavian style, saga style way of doing politics. And, and the, the accepted fact of politics is that people get killed in very nasty ways. The Normans were kind of masters of war and extremely violent when they went to war. But once people had surrendered, almost always they would spare their lives, imprison their enemies um, and ransom them if they agreed to be very well behaved. Um, but they didn't, as a rule, do political killing. And this is something that that you can see pretty much immediately after the conquest in that people... We know I'm talking about high politics here. People of the highest rank are not routinely killing each other. Um, so, the, you know, the, these are all really big changes to the way England is run um, that happen, you know, within the space of 10, 20 years after the Battle of Hastings. Mm. And of course, we have to talk about this as well. For, for example, the, what, why, was there a strategic reason why? William chose to build the infamous Tower of London at one point, or is there just a what the tower built there? I just, I mean, it's in terms of strategy, it's it's fairly straightforward in that London is the premier city of of England at that point, or, or you know, at that date. A uh, hundred years earlier, you might have said Winchester, you know, in at the start of the tenth century. 
um, because that was the old capital of Wessex. Mm. But London is an economic powerhouse like no other, simply because of its situation on the River Thames. Uh, it's it's the you know the, the the last point where the Thames can be bridged, and it's obviously um, you know uh, perfectly placed for for trade with the continent. So London is 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 the most populous and the richest city um, by the time of the Norman Conquest. It's also, lest we forget, it's in London where the resistance to William was the strongest. It's to London that the Anglo Saxons rally after their defeat at Hastings. And it's from London that they emerge finally to submit when everyone else south of London certainly has already submitted. So um, the Tower of London, I can't remember which source it's in. Um, well, I don't think it's the Chronicle, but there is a, is a, a more or less contemporary uh, source that says, uh, it might be William of Poitiers, says that the Tower of London was constructed to kind of keep a check on the population of London, because that's maybe, I'm not quite sure of the numbers, maybe 10 to 20,000 people strong. Um, you want to, you know, um, keep 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 those people under surveillance. And that's the case with, with all the royal castles, or almost all the royal castles built after the conquest. They are built on major towns and cities. So when William goes north in 1068, he's planting castles at places like uh, Lincoln, York, Cambridge, Nottingham, um, Lincoln, you know, because uh, Warwick as well, because the, these are places where, um, you know, there are concentrations of people and rebellions are likely to to um, um, muster. Hmm. Of course, one of the, by perhaps one of the biggest changes after the Norman Conquest is the rise, rise of the dynasty known as the Plantagenets, which would reign all the way until the 1450s. At least for the sixties after the until the war of the was the roses and that perhaps might be one of the biggest changes of all. It's quite a long time for a dynasty in that that age to rule. For it is, I think you there's a, you made a slight jump there though because yeah. when we do if we're talking about the Plantagenets, we're not talking about them until the mid twelfth right. century right. when yeah my, my my bad yeah. Um. Um. Matilda is married to Geoffrey Plantagenet, but I mean, no, no, it's, it's it's a perfectly valid point in that you're you're right in in as much as you're saying England from that point on is is hitched to the continent in a way that it hadn't previously been. So because of course William becoming king of England, that's his most pre that's his new and um, most prestigious shiny hat, but he's also still Duke of Normandy, Ooh. and from that moment moment on, you have a cross channel. Quality. You know, it's not it's not ruled, um, you know, as, as a sort of unified empire, but it is ruled by the same man. And you have men either side of the channel um, who have, you know, who are rather powerful men at his court who have lands either side of the channel. And that remains the case for the most part, although there are periods when they're separated for the most part until the start of the 13th century with King John. Um, so. You know that the Norman Conquest. You're right. Sets in train that connection between England and the continent, mm. um, which 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 goes on right until the end of the Middle Ages. So mm. it is again. You know, there is no greater tipping point in English history than 1066. And I want to. I know you want to run up soon, but I want to talk about as well something with William is that when he became king in England, he was still. A bastard who was still just a duke in Normandy at the time. Yeah, um, I mean, you've mentioned his 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 nickname that you probably wouldn't have used to his face a few times, mm. William the Bastard. Um, it's clear that people were making jokes about his um parentage um from early in his reign as duke. Um, it's also clear in Normandy that no one was particularly fussed about his his illegitimacy. Um, and I don't think they would have been particularly fussed in early 11th century England either. But what's happening in the course of the 11th century is um, the church is on another one of its kind of periodic periods of reform. Um, the reformers take over the papacy in the middle of the 11th century and increasingly reformist um, clergymen are laying down the law by the time William is an adult and saying, this isn't really on, you know, 
what a priest shouldn't have wives priests shouldn't be having children you your children aren't considered legitimate um if they are um born out of wedlock you know if they're if then if your parents weren't married in the church and you can i mean what part of the shift you can see there is william and he's only seven or eight years old when he comes to power in when is it 1035 um nobody in normandy at the time has a problem with that he's accepted he's accepted by the 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 Normans themselves, he's accepted by the King of France. But you you scroll on to this, the accession of, or the reign of, William's youngest son and ultimate successor, Henry I. Henry I, you'll remember, has one legitimate son, William Atheling, who dies in the White Ship Tragedy of 1120, and has any number, an, an unknown number of of bastard sons you know he has i think you rem i remember you writing about this when you mentioned it i think you said the record for bast he has, bastards he, he has the record for 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 royal bastards in england which is 20 plus um <laughs> and he, he the got point, around the point is in if that had been a hundred years earlier any of them could have succeeded him as king the the rules on legitimacy were much were far far weaker um so that's that's um, that's a change that happens in William's own lifetime. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I think to, to kind of get back to the point you were making, he's gone from being a duke, albeit a very powerful duke, a man of not exactly humble means, but means which were increasing, um, or rather status, which was looking uh, decidedly um, uh, sort of illegitimate uh, as time wore on. And you can see, I think, in William's behaviour throughout his whole career a desperate desire to be considered lawful and legitimate not merely in terms of his parentage but by the way he behaves for example after the norman conquest he not only before the conquest asked the pope to bless the enterprise but after the norman conquest he has papal legates come over and impose penances on everyone who participated on the norman side from himself downwards you know if you killed this many people you have to say say this many you know, um, uh, prayers for the rest of eternity, or you have to go on a pilgrimage, or you have to build a church to to um, atone for your sins. You can't imagine Vikings doing that. You can't imagine King Canute doing that, you know, um, a generation or so earlier. But all through his career, and I can't think of any other examples off the top of my head, but I do mention them in my various books on William. Um, there is this desire to say, and that was all legal and legitimate. Doomsday Book is born of the same idea, you know, that this most of the land that changed hands is just men grabbing it. You know, it's kind of right of conquest. That's mine. And, and, and you know, but Doomsday Book gives the impression it was all very tidy and legal and it was nicely transferred and it all sort of, you know, above board. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I think that his um, his illegitimate. Um, um origins are a source of kind of like i don't know without over egging it too much a sort of psychological driver for william throughout his career and another thing and i'm not going to pretend like i don't, don't know how to speak french but it's that the word duke as well arrived from the norman conquest whereas it was in the normandy Dutch, i believe and i'm probably not saying it's right but you just the title of you as well i believe arrived as a result of the Norman Conquest? Uh, not quite, in as much as they don't use Duke in England mm. after the Conquest. I think probably because William felt right. um, that he was Duke of Normandy, and that mm. was something that needed to be kind of kept as a, uh, a, a, a very privileged rank. So before the Conquest, um, when you're looking at Anglo-Saxon documents, you occasionally see um, earls, mm. Um, styled as dukes. It all depends on how people at the time chose to translate words. So if you said, well, I'm Earl of East Anglia, people, someone might say, oh, well, in my country or in Latin or in France, we call that a duke. Um, and uh, soon after the conquest, and you can see, for example, on the Bio Tapestry, Harold is styled Dux Anglorum, Duke of the English, you know, as if that's a, a title. Mm. Um, after the Norman conquest, it soon sort of becomes the standard that Earl is translated as Comes or Count. Mm. Um, and so 
and, and, and William is the only person styled Duke. It's not until the, let's get this right, the middle of the 14th century um, that Edward III's earls or the uh, his you know his sons or the most prestigious of english earls they start saying well actually you're a, not just an earl you're a duke and i think at that point it's because they're competing with french dukes um and they say well you know if, if he's a duke surely i should be a duke you know but not not for the first 300 years after the conquest right i think we've done a round it off there thank you so much for coming back on the podcast before we go of course where can people buy your books? Should they be interested um, in reading them? And do you have any course. websites, links? Do you want me to put in the description below? Yeah, um, well, I just say you can buy the books, all good bookshops or online retailers, you know, and, um, uh, you know, you'll laugh, you'll cry, they'll change your lives. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. This has been, it's been a pleasure to have you back on the podcast. You're always welcome back more. This has been well, that is well. We are available on social media, on Instagram and Twitter, or should I say X? At this point, I don't know. I'm still going to call Twitter and on well, that age as well. We are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you can find podcasts these days. Please like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.